Last time we met, we celebrated together the crossing of the Sea of Reed by the Israelites. We were escaping Pharaoh's chariots pursuing us. Moses, with the help of God, parted the sea for us. We crossed the sea and on the other side began singing and rejoicing for our newfound freedom as the sea crashed upon Pharaoh's armies. And then this week between our Shabbat services, we began to uh, wander through the desert. We made our way after a few days to the foot of Mount Sinai. And then, and then we experienced revelation. God appeared and gave us the ten pronouncements, the top most ten most important spiritual teachings ever to be bestowed upon humankind at Sinai. This week is kind of the day after. And Moses is giving us what is going to be known as the, the book of laws, the code, the, diff, the code of laws that will be an extension of, an, an expansion of those ten pronouncements. Because we felt they were a little bit too vague. You shall not kill. You know, what do you do with that? I mean, <laughs> so we needed more to really give us the nitty gritty of what that meant. Do not steal. I don't know. There's many ways to look at it. And so this book of the covenant, as it is known, fills this entire Torah portion this week. And there are many of those laws that we borrowed from many other nations around us and some that actually were created by, um, by our sages, by our ancient narrators, our scribes. But you can tell the paradox of the code of law, the first code of law. Because we are still at that moment a wandering tribe. And all the laws that supposedly Moses gives us are all relating to an agrarian society. And so we know that there is a little bit of a disconnect here between our situation in, as a wandering tribe in the desert and those laws that don't seem to apply to us yet at all. But obviously they foreshadow our settling the promised land. And I could choose from so many of them. There are so many of them that are so relevant to this day. Come to Torah study tomorrow at 10.30 in the morning in the Beraif office and we'll, we'll tackle a few of them. We'll discuss how relevant or not they are to this time. But there's one really this week that captured my attention because it's up. It's up for us right here, right now in the unfolding story, history of America. And that verse is, you shall not oppress a stranger, a foreigner, for you know the feeling, feelings of the stranger having yourself been strangers in the land of Egypt. It's a pretty straightforward 3,000 year old commandment on the face of it. Pretty logical. You shall not oppress the stranger, the foreigner, because you yourself were a stranger in the land of Egypt, wherever land you have come from. But we have to ask ourselves this question. 
After 3,000 years or so of having received this commandment, how are we doing? I mean, how are we doing, really? I mean, as, as, as humanity, we've had 3,000 years to wrestle with this one. How are we doing? And also, you know, it is also addressed to us individually. How are you doing with this one? How are you doing with treating the other, the strange, the different, the stranger? How are we doing? Honestly, how are you doing in your life every day? Nechama Leibovitch, one of the greatest Israeli biblical scholars of the 20th century, a, a woman who became really one of the, the top, highest, uh, highly regarded scholars in her generation. Nechama Leibovitch wrote, and I quote, about this verse. Only if there is pain and a high price to pay, only then will someone be kind to the stranger. That's Nechama Leibovitch. Only if there is pain and a high price to pay, only then will someone be kind to the stranger. Leibovitch is telling us that we would be kind to each other only if there are consequences to our action. Only if we are coerced into it. Only if there is a sense that there will be punishment, retaliation. Only then will we find within us the nobility to be kind to the stranger, to the other. It's a pretty dark understanding of this verse, I would concede. But if we look at world history, from the time there were probably human beings on earth, to this day, we might be forced to conclude that, give or take a few exceptions over the years, Mother Teresa, some of the righteous among the nations, few and far between, we would be forced to align ourselves with Nechama's conclusion. I mean, we can look at the history of this country, for example, you know, the country that is a nation of immigrants. How are we doing with that? Right? If, if the verse is correct, that we shall treat each other better because of our own experience, then all of us as immigrants should be aware and mindful of the next wave of immigrant and the next wave of immigrant and treat them the way we would like, we would have loved ourselves to be treated, first of all, when we came here. But in each generation, with each wave of immigration, those immigrants were denigrated, were mistreated. If we take a look at the history of the Jewish people, when there were no consequences throughout our history, let's say, in, under Christendom, we were persecuted, we were hunted, we were murdered, and 70 years ago we even were exterminated. All that under the rule of the religion of love. If there are no consequences, as there were no consequences under Nazi Germany rule, then we will hunt the Jews wherever we find them. Look at what's going on in our nation. Those captains of industry, of big pharma, big agro-business, big oil, if there are no consequences to their actions, they will continue to pollute and destroy this planet of ours. And they do, because there are no consequences. They have bought anyone who might legislate or stand in their way. 
our banks, our financial, insti financial institutions, who almost bankrupt the global economy just 10 years ago, are at it again right now. Why? Was there any retribution, any punishment, any consequence of the disaster they brought upon all of us? Instead, rather, their bonuses grew bigger. If there are no consequences to anything, then as human beings, Nechama Leibovich may be right. We do not have it in us to be kind to others, to be kind to our environment, to be kind to other life forms. Recently, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, have highlighted, brought into the light, the fact that abuse and violence towards the other, be it African American people, women, and other minorities has gone on and it keeps on going and keeps going on in our nation, in our neighborhoods, in our offices, in our workplaces, in our religious centers, our meditation retreats. Still unabated because to this day, frankly, we haven't seen really what the consequences would be or where the punishment could be. So perhaps, as uh, human beings, we are doomed. Nechama Leibovich may have been right. There is really no hope for us. Rashi would take offense to Nechama Leibovich's conclusions. Rashi was the, the other French rabbi who lived in the 11th century, who wrote, and I quote, only the wise connects to the past and will not oppress the stranger. See, Rashi is looking at the second half of the verse that says, you know, you've been strangers in Egypt, and because of that past experience, therefore, dot, 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 you will therefore not oppress the strangers in your midst. Rashi concedes that the unwise may be those that Nechama Leibovich is, re is referring to in her statement, even though she lived about a thousand years after him. But, but the wise, the one who learns from the past, the one for whom his own life experience or the life experience of the generations that preceded him or her, the one who keep the memory of that oppression alive will not, in fact, act in this kind of way, will be kind to strangers. Now, I don't mean to look at every other nation in the world. Let's take a look at our nation. Let's take a look at the Jewish nation. I would venture to say, and I might get stoned for that, that the Jewish nation over the 3,000 years of its existence might have been the one people most oppressed over time, over those 3,000 years. Almost in every generation, we suffered from violence, we suffered from, um, from hatred, we, we faced a pretty dismal history, which is one of the first things that I ask people who want to convert to Judaism, have you ever looked at our history? Why would you want to join this group? <laughs> anyway, that's, another, that's a matter for another time. But, but take just the, the last 140, 150 years. Jews in the late 1800s escaped Eastern Europe because of massive pogroms that were happening there. And many of them went to the land of Israel. Many of them came here. But many of them went to the land of Israel. A couple of decades later, the Zionist movement is born out of Europe. Theodor Herzl's vision, watching Captain Dreyfus being stepped stripped of his um, 
of his rank, accused of being a spy to others, his sword broken in front of everybody. And the masses of French people shouting death to the Jews. Dreyf, uh, Herzl in that moment understood this is 1894 and wrote that it was no, there was no future for the Jews in Europe. And all of that generation, many of them who lived through those most dire times, went to the land of Israel to try to create and eventually create a safe heaven for Jews. It is fair to say that all who had emigrated to Israel in those decades of the last decades of the 1800s and the first decades of the 1900s all left persecution all left because of oppression. Here's a nation that is created with people who in their blood and in their psyche carry oppression. Today, those who have also, who are still alive, having survived the Holocaust, and the descendants of those who came to Israel because they were fleeing persecution, seems to be the one who now despite the history and despite the memory are the ones that are, that, are, that are oppressing those who have become strangers there. Maybe Rashi is wrong then. But before we throw the book at Israel, uh, we, it, it is incumbent upon us to question why why would Rashi be wrong? Why would Rashi's example doesn't work for the history of the Jewish people themselves? Why after so much oppression, they couldn't help themselves but do the same to those in the land they share? And I believe that what Rashi did not understand is that to hold the memory of oppression breeds oppression. And in fact, to keep alive those kind of trauma breeds trauma. We left the Holocaust with the mantra, never again. Now, if you're going to build a country with a mantra, never again, then you're going to build a country where never again never happens there. Which means, maybe I didn't phrase that correctly, but which means that you're going to make sure that you are always going to be able to defend yourself because never again. That you will arm yourself to the teeth because never again. That you will live in the fear of the other because never again. Because of the trauma you have been through for so many generations, here is the time and here is the place where right now you can take care of your own people and therefore you're going to build a wall. You're going to build a wall and you're going to defend yourself and you're going to make sure that those others who in fact are showing you that they are intent on killing you, that are describing in their platforms or, or omitting to put Israel on their maps are really com sharing a message with you that they don't want you here. And so we have to also think about the creation of Israel with this never again understanding. That does not excuse what's going on in Israel, but that might give us a way of explaining one avenue to understand what's going on there. But with that, we still have disproven Rashi's premise. And we would be forced to conclude that in fact, Nechama Leibovitch wins the day then. And I suspect that she does. I suspect that she does. I think that she does because I don't think we are in that place yet where that is allowed to evolve or to change. See, I came across yet another commentary by another rabbi, 
His name is Leo Beck. He's, uh, he was a 20th century American uh, scholar. And he writes, where are you, Leo? Hmm. We are all strangers living in God's house. We are all strangers living in God's house. This is how he understands this verse. And to me, this is, this is ultimately how we are to understand this verse. We are all strangers in God's house. But the problem, problem is that to, to this day, we have created God's house in such a narrow way that we have, drew, we have drawn a line outside of which the others dwell. And the, the selected few are the ones who dwell in the house of God and not the others. And so we have created the strangers. Leo Beck is inviting us to understand that the house of God embraces all. That it is not possible for us to limit how far the house of God reaches. That we are all equally sacred in the eyes of the divine. That we are to take the sentences in Genesis that we are all created Betzelem Elohim in the image of God, as an expression of God, seriously. And to see each other, whichever shape we have, whichever color we have, whichever religion we embrace, whichever everything, as all living in the great house of God. Because no one can be pushed out of the house of God. No one can dwell outside the house of God. There is no outside the house of God. There are no outsiders. We are all strangers. We are all immigrants. But that idea, that understanding, will require an evolution of consciousness that unfortunately, until further notice, we haven't reached yet. At least not en masse. Maybe a few of us in a community such as this can relate to understanding and seeing the world in this kind of way, which is why I believe that this spiritual community is so important, so valuable, so needed. Because it is one of those few have heavens, heavens, for us to be able to take in a different perspective, to embrace a different way of relating to each other of seeing each other. To know that in the house of God, there are no strangers. And if there are any strangers, then all of us are. And we might be a few generations away from that, according to what we are seeing right now. In fact, it feels like we are devolving. That the process of evolution that we had witnessed over the last few decades is being crushed. But it will take each and every one of us. It will take each and every one of you, wherever you live, wherever you work, to embody the words of Leo Beck. And to talk this way to whomever you are encountering, beyond your own media bubble, because in our own media bubble, we all agree. We all agree with Rabbi Leo Beck. But we have to move beyond that. We have to reach beyond that. 